Okay, this video is the current newsletter for September 2023. I'm writing a newsletter about once a month. If anybody wants to sign up for the newsletter, just uh, go to the emails. I got it listed like on a homepage for this. I'll put it in the links below this. Um, so the topic for today, this month is how to prevent dementia. And for preventing dementia, it's good to understand the main theories of dementia. And by the way, this will probably be the best lecture on the whole internet about a dementia. This is my other lectures. And the reason I tell you that is, if you go into the books, the dementia textbooks, they all stink. I'm not aware of a single good one. The only good book about dementia I know of is, well, the best book about dementia is The Alzheimer Turning Point by Jack Della Torre, this guy right here, Jack Della Torre, Ph.D. He's the guy who tied off the carotid artery in a mouse. So imagine this is the carotid, carotid artery. There's the big arteries in front of the neck. They go up to the brain. He tied off the carotid artery. He found that middle-aged and older mice, they become demented two months after that, okay? If, and then, you know, you look at their brain at autopsy, there's no stroke. What there is is the brain is shrunken. Uh, so that's called atrophy. And the mechanism is the neurons are dying slowly due, due to lack of blood flow. Uh, so he called it the theory of chronic cerebral hypoperfusion. Uh, hypo just means, you know, decrease, hypoperfusion is decreased blood flow. The neurons can't get enough energy because they don't have enough oxygen and glucose delivery and they die, okay? And you say, well, so what? How many patients have atherosclerotic occlusion of their internal carotid artery? Not that many, but tons of patients have chronic cerebral hypoperfusion problems. I made a, re by the way, every single thing in this video, I've made much longer detailed videos with all kinds of illustrations, pictures, and references. But I'm just kind of giving a quick summary here. So what happens is, think about uh, hypertension. If the blood pressure is too high, you're at risk for intracranial bleed. Not only are you at risk for intracranial bleed, but that high pressure, it causes damage to the arteries. You know, if you have a high systolic pressure, it gets damaged. What happens, you initially have ascending thoracic aorta like a second heart. It has a lot of elastic fibers. When the heart contracts, it is stretched outward by the pressure of that contraction. And then during diastole, the relaxation phase of the cardiac cycle, the elastic fibers recall back in and that pushes blood along to maintain blood flow during diastole, during the relaxation phase of heart cardiac contraction. Well, guess what? People who are, who are eating high fat diets with a lot of sodium, they overstretch that ascending thoracic aorta and it starts to fail and you can't replace those fibers after about 20 years of age. So what ends up happening is the ascending thoracic aorta becomes stiff and calcified. I see these all the time. I look at CT angiograms every day, you know, the chest and the brain and chest, neck and brain. So what ends up happening is once that already becomes calcified, it's lost its elastic fibers, then in order to maintain the same amount of blood flow to the brain, you have to crank up the systolic blood pressure, the, the contraction phase of the cardiac cycle, the higher number when you list the blood pressure, you know, like 120 over 80. Okay, so because of that, you're gonna have higher and higher systolic pressures. Those high systolic pressures, they bang against the arterial walls and they damage them. And as they damage them in response, the small arterial walls in the brain develop scar tissue. We call it fibrosis and their walls become thickened and they become less able to deliver oxygen effectively to the brain tissue. That's partly why older people become mentally slower, okay? So um, that's important. So what am I saying though? You're almost double screwed with hypertension though. If the pressure is too high, you damage the arteries, potentially you have the potential risk of bleed, but more commonly you're just damaging arteries from that high pressure. If you drop the pressure too low by taking antihypertensive medicines, you wanna keep it in the, in the Goldilocks zone. I made a video about that recently, the Goldilocks zone for hypertension. Because if you overtreat the hypertension with medications and you drive the pressure too low, then you don't have an adequate perfusion pressure to the brain. Where's the hardest spot to get blood flow? To your brain when you're standing up, okay? So the best thing you can do is optimize your pressure as much as possible by optimizing your diet. The main things that drive up blood pressure causing hypertension are high fat diets because they stick the red blood cells together, rouleau formation, stack of coins in French, like by elevated LDL cholesterol or the chylomicrons causing blood sludge. You know, oil's a, you know, a sticky mess. You know, think about it when you're cooking. It's a big mess all over the place, making stuff stick together. It's hard to wash off. That's what it's like in your blood. Okay, so overtreated hypertension, I think, is the main cause of cerebral hypoperfusion. And just hypertension itself, I think, is the main cause of damaging arteries in the brain. That and diabetes. All right. And you say, well, what else will do it? Well, congestive heart failure, CHF, aortic valve regurgitation, aortic valve stenosis intraoperative and post-op hypotension after cardiac surgery, you know, cabbage, coronary artery bypass graft, atrial fibrillation, you lose atrial filling, atrial kick, chronic cerebral hypoperfusion, you're like the mouse, those are mouse equivalents. Okay, 
So remember that. Trust me, I've studied hypertension. I studied uh, dementia, cognitive impairment, and cognitive optimization for decades. And I'm telling you, that's like one of the most important things you can know. Get that concept of the mouse having the carotid artery tied off, not enough blood going to the brain, and you'll be able to understand tons of things about dementia. Okay, what's the next theory? The next best theory, and these are complementary because we're sort of addressing, there's overlap, but they're different. And this is my theory of neurovascular coupling. And by the way, you won't find deletory in any of the standard textbooks. You won't find me in any of the standard textbooks, okay? But this is the best information. My neurology colleagues will agree with this. My neuroradiology colleagues agree with this. Okay, now this is my theory, neurovascular uncoupling. So basically, you've got a neuron in your brain and it has a fixed amount of metabolic activity. If something happens and it gets excited, it has to do more things, okay? So its metabolic activity will increase. It's stressed out, it's being chased by a tiger in the dark, it has to climb a tree, okay, whatever. So the point I'm making is the blood flow, the oxygen and glucose delivery has to be coupled so they match each other, all right? And if the person is stressed out and you have to run being chased by a tiger in the dark, that's a classic example of stress for medical students, is the metabolic activity goes up in that neuron, so the oxygen and glucose delivery has to go up too to stay neurovascular coupled, all right? Now, people do a lot of things that mess up this ratio. If you increase the metabolic rate in this neuron, for example, monosodium glutamate, about 80% of the neurotransmitter in the brain are glutamate and they're excitatory, meaning they increase the activity of the affected neuron, all right? So they're gonna increase metabolic rate. Monosodium glutamate will do that. Psychological stress, psychological stress increases glutamate. Sleep deprivation does the same thing as uh, stress, increases glutamate, okay? Um, corticosteroid medication, same thing. So all those things are increasing the metabolic rate. Now, monosodium glutamate, that'll increase it. Caffeine does the same thing. Caffeine raises the same hormones as stress. You're increasing that metabolic rate, not good. All right, how about aspartame, the sweetener? That'll do it as well. It's an excitatory neurotransmitter. How about glyphosate, glycine phosphate? If you look at the NMDA receptor for uh, glutamate, it's also activated by glycine, okay? So that'll increase it. Your magnesium deficient, because you don't need enough plants, that'll increase it because that causes opening of the receptor. Normally, magnesium blocks the center of the NMDA receptor for glutamate on the postsynaptic neuron. Okay, so you get my point. All of those things are increasing this neuron's metabolic rate, and meaning that you're gonna need more oxygen and glucose delivery to keep these neurons functioning adequately. Well, guess what? What do a lot of people do? They eat a high fat meal. That causes blood sludge, rouleau formation. That drops oxygen and glucose delivery by about you know, 15, 20%. And what else do they do? They have a lot of sodium in that meal. It's a vasoconstrictor. That drops oxygen and glucose delivery even more, okay? So you can see the problem there. You're gonna widen this gap. And the more you widen this gap, the bigger problem it becomes. And then a lot of times they're doing other things like they're eating things that are mitochondrial inhibitors, meaning that they decrease the ability of the mitochondria to make energy. And I recently gave a lecture on this mitochondrial inhibitor, so what's the point? If you drop the um, ability of this neuron to make energy because you're inhibiting it, saturated fat causes reversal of electron transport. That's the main mechanism of insulin resistance. So that will cause the, the same effect as lowering the oxygen and glucose delivery, all right? Let me put this up here because we're gonna have to drop this some more. So you can see where we're at. Trichloroethylene from dry cleaning, mitochondrial inhibitor, okay? Lead, cadmium, mercury, aluminum, uh, fluoride, all of these things, hydroxynanol from omega-6 cooking oils. You're widening this gap. Now you see the problem? The wider this gap gets between oxygen and glucose delivery and the metabolic activity of this neuron, the more likely this neuron basically is going to die. It's gonna say, you know, F it. I can't handle it anymore, and it'll die. If you suddenly occlude a big artery and all the blood's gone, that's called anoxia. A means none. Anoxia, no oxygen. The neurons all die suddenly. Their plasma membranes lice. You see this big uh, mess of uh, fluid and edema in the brain, and I can point to it in my finger. That's where the patient had a stroke, right there, okay? Precentral gyrus on the left side, okay? I, on the other hand, with this gradual loss of adequate oxygen and glucose delivery, these nerves die slowly. So rapid death with a stroke, that's called necrosis. Lysis of the plasma membrane, big mess, okay? But gradual slow death of these neurons is called apoptosis. That's an important word, you need to know that, apoptosis. And because they die gradually, what's happening is they recycle themselves. Their organelles, the uh, chemical constituents of their different parts are packaged into vesicles, they're ingested by the microglia, and they're recycled to other locations and cells. So you don't see anything on a brain MRI. All you see is that the brain is shrunken, it's atrophic. Okay, more cerebral spinal fluid filling up these enlarged cell sites. 
And that's the most common thing that happens. I look at tons of demented brains, thousands and thousands of them, and I can tell you what I most commonly see is an atrophic brain. The same thing Delatore saw in his mice, okay? And I can tell you almost all of my demented patients, at least 90% of them, they're both diabetic and hypertensive, okay? And another 5% are one or the other, and sometimes I wouldn't be surprised if that's because the chart just didn't get updated, that they got both, all right? But the reason why I emphasize this neurovascular coupling is because there's, I'm going to give you a list of all the things that cause this. And you can avoid them, okay? It's a good idea to quit drinking caffeine, all right? Because caffeine's a double screw job. It not only increases the metabolic rate of those neurons, it drops the oxygen and glucose delivery by about 15%. It drops blood flow about 15% to the brain. It's a vasoconstrictor. constrictor. Okay, uh, let's see. Miscellaneous toxin theories of the brain. You know, for example, you're going to hear a lot of people talking about aluminum. Aluminum is a neurotoxin, but it's just one of many. Alcohol is a neurotoxin. Mercury is a neurotoxin. Lead is a neurotoxin. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, the next one to mention to you is the leaky gut cascade theory. Now, that one's a little bit complicated. This guy is brilliant. Uh, so is his partner, Etheresia Pretorius. She's a lady doctor uh, from South Africa. He's from England. He's got a great video. It's called The Systems Biology Approach to, um, I think, Oxidative Stress or something. I forget the exact title of it, but it's brilliant. It's like one of the most cited papers. He wrote a paper called Iron Behaving Badly. Okay, and he, he's kind of, I think, a good example of like an idiot savant scientist. What I mean by that is his the quality of his science with Etheresia Pretoris is like genius level. It's great. You know, he's a big fat guy, you know, so he don't know much about nutrition. So I kind of laugh. There's a lot of doctors like that and a lot of PhDs like that. They're absolutely brilliant in their field. They make discoveries like they deserve a Nobel Prize. But, you know, you get them out of their comfort zone, they don't know anything. All right, so anyways, but it's a brilliant lecture. It's clever. It's funny. They write well, too. He wrote a great paper called Iron Behaving Badly. It's really good. And that's all about ferrous redox cycling where Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus keep cycling back and forth between each other and handing off electrons to oxygen-containing molecules adjacent to them, creating free radicals and causing oxidative stress and lipid peroxidation. That's interesting stuff. The bottom line is you don't want to become iron overloaded because you increase the amount of oxidative stress. And you don't want leaky gut because leaky gut allows bacterial bacteria to pass their toxins, endotoxins, into your blood. Okay. Also, the bacteria themselves get into your blood. But then they can't grow because they don't have any iron, all right? They don't have any iron because our body sequesters iron. That's how we prevent them from growing, all right? It's like a human can't walk 100 miles in the desert because there's no water. Well, a bacteria can't travel around our body and grow because there's no iron for it to use. But when pe as people get older, women postmenopausal, men starting after their 20s, they gradually keep becoming more and more iron overloaded. And then especially when something happens to them as they get older, some of their liver cells die, they liver's a storage site for iron, they release their iron into the blood, you got these dormant bacteria sitting around and they'll grow, okay? But by avoiding leaky gut and avoiding iron overload, you prevent, prevent all that. Okay, next thing is traumatic brain injury. Yeah, that's a common cause of uh, dementia. We all know about the football players, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. We know about Muhammad Ali, you know. Um, dementia pugilista, okay. Um, and then I think on the next page, I'm going to go into what the Japanese guy was talking about. There's a Japanese guy by Tetsumori Yamashima, MD, PhD. And he was given the task, why are so many people becoming in, demented in Japan when that didn't used to be the case? And the conclusion he came to is because they're eating way more cooking oils than they used to, those omega-6 cooking oils. And it's leading to lipid peroxidation, production of a toxic aldehyde called hydroxynanonol and um, subsequent uh, lipid peroxidation damage to brain cells. All right, by the way, again, I got videos and all this stuff with illustrations and stuff, but I'm just here kind of helping you to get the big picture on dementia. So the most important thing you could do is avoid all the risk factors for atherosclerosis, hypertension, and obesity, okay, and diabetes, because that's the main thing that drives you to it. All these other things are like icing on the cake, and you end up like, here's a bunch of uh, pens and highlighters I got, right? You're stacking stuff on the camel's back, okay? Let's say this is the camel here. You know, you keep putting all this stuff on the camel's back, and sooner or later, you hit a threshold and those neurons start to die, all right? So the main thing driving you towards it is all this diabetes and hypertension stuff, but the uh, these other things are just piling on. Okay, I got a disclaimer here, you know, the funny old Oscar Wilde line, you know, I'm half Irish, so I love the Irish jokes. I have nothing to declare but my genius, is what Oscar Wilde said when he came to the United States 
Um, this book's not for educational purpose. I'm not your doctor. This, I'm just a lonely old autistic hermit who writes these newsletters because I got nothing else to do. There's actually some truth in that. Uh, dietary change can have a powerful effect. If you're taking any meds, especially for high blood pressure, diabetes, or anticoagulation, let your doctor know before you change your diet because it can change your medication dosages. It probably will. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about positive things on the brain because they're all it's part of the same picture. Voltaire asked the question, why do animals have brains but plants do not? Because an animal moves. As soon as you start moving, you have to make a value judgment. What are you going to walk towards? I'm going to go towards the fruit tree because I'm hungry. I'm going to stay away from there because all those coyotes, they might bite me. Okay, you got to navigate any obstacles in your path. You have to have a memory to remember how you find, to find your way back to where you came from. Um, you have to decide, you know, and why is it like this? The reason it's like this is, think about it. If you're an animal, and animals are always outdoors, as soon as they walk into a new environment, they have to figure it out very quickly. That's why exercise makes you smart, because it activates your brain. Where is the food? Where is the safety? Where is the danger? How do I find my way back, okay? Um, that That's one of the best things you could do to age well, is keep exercising. Um, let's see. What is the purpose of the brain? You know, why do you even have a brain? So you could walk on a path in a forest, a jungle, or a prairie and survive. You know, avoid the danger of that environment so you don't get eaten by a predator. You also got to, you know, sweet talk a woman or you ain't going to have no kids. So the social component of it is important. You got to get along with people because people do best when they help each other. Um, also, there's some interesting things. There's a sea squirt animal. You can look it up. Just type it into your browser. Sea squirt life cycle. And a sea squirt, when it's a, when it's a juvenile, it swims around as a tadpole. It's got a brain. As an adult, it attaches to a rock, and it becomes a filter feeder. Its brain is reabsorbed, because you don't need a brain if you just sit on your butt watching TV all day. Um, let's see. So exercise improves the brain in multiple ways. And it increases something called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic growth factor, which causes new neurons to grow, causes new synapses to form. The way you learn anything new is you connect it to some information you already know by association, by analogy, by metaphor, okay, by putting it into a category. That's how all new information is, is learned and entered into the brain. Um, it increases glycogen storage, especially in the astrocytes. That's like a polymer or glucose to have more energy available. If you think about it, you know, think about college or grad school. You first start out, it's kind of hard to study for two hours. But the more you get in the habit of studying every day, you can eventually study six, seven, eight, nine, ten hours. You build up the capacity to do that. Okay, increased mitochondrial biogenesis means the formation of new mitochondria. If you're pushing yourself a lot, let's say with your exercise, you don't just form mitochondria in your muscles, you form them in your brain. Because again, your brain has to be active whenever you're exercising and doing stuff. Our brain is much more made for movement than it is for thinking, okay? The human brain did not evolve to do calculus. It evolved to be more successful in the wild, you know. Um, and that also brings up Moravec's paradox. Moravec's paradox was the idea that the uh, hard problem was easy, the easy problem was hard with regard to scientists could make a computer do calculus back in the 1950s. But it's only recently that they're starting to get better with robotics because it's very difficult to make uh, a robot move like a human, you know, in a coordinated, smooth fashion. Okay, um... What else does exercise do? It, it increases angiogenesis, formation of little capillaries, uh, new blood vessels in the areas of the brain that are more active. Like if somebody plays piano, they'll have more you know, angiogenesis and neurons in the areas related to their fingers moving on a keyboard. Okay, um, what type of exercise is best? Anything you want to do. By the way, I'm going to get in a lot of complicated stuff. This exercise, I know you heard a lot of this before and it sounds easy. Trust me, I'm going to get in a lot of advanced cool stuff. But I just figured I'd throw in a little easy stuff at the beginning. Okay, um... What, so whatever you like doing, you know, walking is the best thing for most people. You know, great. Take your dog for a walk outdoors, get some exercise. That's a little bit social too. Um, I like to lift weights. You know, every weekend I'll do uh, high repetition squats. I like that because it's almost a form of hits, high intensity interval training. Um, and I use a safety squat bar so I can have my hands in front because I got a little bit of shoulder problem. I can't, it hurts my shoulder, my hands put them all the way back. So a lot of old guys, I can't squat because I got shoulder problem. Use a safety squat bar. You can still squat probably. Squat is just like getting up from a chair, okay? It's a pretty basic exercise and it exercises the whole body. And by doing high rep squats, I think you're much less likely to get injured, okay? Um, I like doing isometrics too. I do isometrics uh, twice, a, twice a week. We'll talk about that some other time, but that, that's actually surprisingly valuable, Isometrics actually, I think, tones your whole body. It's a real easy way to get strong. Um, let's see. Push-ups, free weights, yeah. All right. Um, 
Every day, I also walk a lot. Just make yourself move. You know, when you go to the bathroom, go to the farthest possible bathroom. Try to go up the stairs with the flies. Like I told you, with my wife, you know, you know, was it uh, uh, what the comedians Dave Barry said? What's the secret of a successful marriage? Separate bathrooms, okay? So my wife, you know, she's always trying to get the advantage on me. She's like, we had to negotiate who gets what bathroom. And she's like, I want the bathroom on the ground floor. I'm like, okay, fine. All right. And she thought she won a big victory over me. I acted like I was sad and bummed out that she got the good bathroom, the big, nice bathroom. You know what? I won because I have to walk to this real far away bathroom and go up a bunch of stairs. Good. So I get I get better exercise every day. Every day I go through tons of stairs. I go up like 50 flights of stairs every day or 100 flights of stairs. I go through tons of stairs. Uh, keeps me fit. I'm 60 years old. I got no medical problems. I'm strong. I'm smart. I can concentrate all day long. I'm not this like fat, sick, and stupid like a typical American. Okay. Um, you know, whenever you get a phone call, stand up. Hello. What can I do for you? Okay. You're just standing there, you know, talking on the phone. You might as well stand up for a moment. Okay. Uh, what else makes you smarter? Um, purposeful learning. Like, you know, my dad, he was a great role model for me. He liked to read a lot. He worked all day and then he would exercise, taking the dog for a walk in the park. And then at night he would listen, he would stay in his room, he'd listen to classical music and he'd read a book, you know, usually instrumental classical music while he read a book. And he was a real cultured guy in a sense. He knew a lot of the history of Europe, the history of Christianity. And for me, that was a man. Plus when he was in college, he had, he had been like a valedictorian of his high school and he was like a boxing champion in college and he quit boxing because he said he was scared of all the head trauma, okay? But... What I'm trying to say is that was my role model growing up, to be like my old man. And it was good for me, okay? But I, I actually noticed an advantage I got on my old man. He would just read for pleasure. He was a psychiatrist, and I think a psychiatrist in some ways is good for reading because anything you read is potentially a conversational item the next day in your psychiatric environment, all right? Uh, but I actually think that's not the best way to read. Um, like, for example, when I read, it is for a purpose, I ask myself a question, what causes diabetes? And then I will study that until I feel like I've gone as far as I can with it. What causes hypertension? What causes dementia? What happened in the history of Ireland? What happened in the history of Christianity? Things I'm interested in, and I'll just study them. And, and the reason why I think that's a better way to learn, because I'm doing it with a purpose. Because you hear a lot of people say, well, old people can maintain cognition better if they do intellectually challenging things like play some brain training game or do a crossword puzzle. And I personally think that's kind of BS, and I'll tell you why. Because our brain's designed to memorize things, to remember things that are important to us, okay? You know, if you like Betty, you care about Betty, okay? If you're interested in diabetes, you care about diabetes. I don't randomly care about everything. Nobody does, okay? The only auctioneer, Oscar Wilde said, the only auctioneer, the only person who likes all types of art is an auctioneer. Okay, you gotta, if you want to develop your brain, you gotta focus it on a topic, whatever that might be, you know? Uh, Goethe had always said, we must constantly concentrate our powers, you know, meaning that we got to focus on something, get good at it. That's how you develop your mind, not just randomly. Um, okay, so anyways, uh, adequate sleep. You got to sleep. That's, you know, I talk to these memory champions and they'll say the best thing you could do is just get a good night's sleep. I never did an all-nighter, you know, when I was in school. I was a great student. That was, never. I just prepared, did, you know. Walk and talks, you know, self-test, active recall, all that kind of stuff. Condensed notes, illustrated condensed notes, okay. Uh, Flashcards, uh, lightener boxes, space interval repetition systems, Anki, all that stuff. Okay, stress management's real important, so you don't have too much glue to make uh, going all the time. A low fat, low sodium, 100% vegan, 100% organic diet with no oil, no caffeine. Olive oil, by the way, is crap. Don't go don't for olive. All these people on the internet telling you olive oil is good. They're a bunch of idiots and liars. Don't pay attention to them. Um... I have a whole video on olive oil. What a joke it is. Okay, caffeine's bad for you. I have a video on, you know, how you can quit uh, coffee and tea. Tea, I think, is for chumps, too. Okay, I, I got separate videos on that. Alcohol, I got a video on that. That's for chumps. It's all bad. Even that one drink a day stuff, that's all nonsense. Okay, um, MJ is for idiots. MJ, you know, the typical person who, who likes MJ is always some obnoxious idiot who's convinced that they're like some wise contrarian and they're stupid. I got a lot of neurology friends. They always tell me all these patients with terrible outcomes messing around with MJ. Okay, no sweets, no processed food. Um, okay, enough of that intro stuff. Now we're gonna get into we're gonna gradually get into more advanced stuff. Okay, what makes you dumber? These are things you should avoid. Head trauma. Avoid all head trauma. Okay. 
Like I, I have a lot of parents, a lot of doctor parents and go, oh, you know, I've had my son playing soccer. And I tell them flat out, I say this to my lady doctor friends, I say, you're stupid, okay? You shouldn't let your kid play soccer. You know, hitting the soccer ball with your head, it's like volunteering to be punched in the head. It's stupid, okay? Soccer players have notoriously poor cognitive outcomes, you know? I knew a lady doctor, you know, her daughter played soccer and she got so much brain damage, she had to drop out of college. I knew this other lady, I'm not going to say her name, but it was like, you know, at first you look at her and she seems, and then she talks and she sounds kind of stupid when she talks. She got brain damage from playing soccer. Um, and, and there's lots of other ones. I've heard a lot of bad things from soccer. People think soccer is a safe, pleasant sport. No, watch out for soccer. I think soccer would be a great sport if they changed the rule that you don't um, hit the ball with your head. The other thing is a lot of guys think they're macho and they want to do MMA and stuff. And what I'm saying is do some form of MMA where you don't get punched in the head. Because if you get punched in the head, that's going to cause brain damage and that could ruin your life. There's nothing good about having brain damage, okay? I see tons and tons of brain damage patients. They've had significant head trauma. They've got chronic headaches, brain fog, can't concentrate, attention deficit. It's not good. You don't want that. So don't be, you know, macho, stupid idiot, all right? Uh, find a sport you like without getting head trauma. Okay, stupid hobbies. All right, you know, just don't be doing stupid stuff. Don't do anything where there's a risk of head trauma. You know, like some people got these motorized skateboards. I've seen people fall off those things and have massive intracranial bleeds. The surgeon can't even control the bleeding, has to take off part of their skull. These are young patients too, 20s and 30s, and they end up, you know, cognitively impaired on ventilators. It's a disaster. Okay, uh, so never get one of those things. All right, next topic, inhaling toxic fumes. A lot of people, part of their job, they got to work with a lot of toxic fumes. Let's say you're a welder or a janitor with the cleaning chemicals, dry cleaner person. Try to not have those jobs, but if you have to have them, open the door, ventilate the area, consider a fan, consider a new job. Okay, um, anything that smells bad is bad for you in general. There's some exceptions, but pretty much that's pretty much true. Okay, uh, and you should pay attention to it, you know, because I've got family members who think it's no big deal to open up the dishwasher like when i'm standing there i'm trying to like prepare my food and i go that's obnoxious i don't want to smell that soap and they always say oh you're so hypersensitive you're paranoid blah 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 i say no i'm just intelligent i pay attention to my senses okay i got a nose for a reason it tells you when something's bad you don't want to be inhaling toxic fumes and your nose is the pathway to your brain you know a lot of people don't realize that but the olfactory nerve from the nose goes right back to the brain and that going right back to the brain, that's why, for example, like one of the stupidest things you could do would be you spray on deodorant with aluminum in it because that aluminum will go into your, your olfactory nerve and have some access to your brain. Plus, it's thought that the cortex that enables you to think effectively, there was a scientist by the name of Lynch, real smart guy, I think he's from Loma Linda, and he said, you know what, he thinks it's that entorhinal cortex for smell which has led to um, the human mind in the sense that, you know, coming theoretically from the ancient animals, you know, the rodents, the lower animals is what he says. I don't know if that's really true. It's sort of that theory of the big, you know, collision, uh, the meteorites, the comets, and then they hit the earth and made everything dark and the dinosaurs all died. They needed the sunshine, but the, the night vision rodent mammals survived. Okay. Anyways, I'm not going to get into all that, but the point was the entorhinal cortex for smell was able to freely associate a bunch of different things. Whereas, you know, touch and perception and these types of movements are relatively fixed versus entorhinal smell associations. That smells like my girlfriend. That smells like my dog. That smells like food. That smells like whatever. <laughs> Those smells are free association. So that part of the brain which was able to free associate was more capable of developing a wide range of thoughts and able to eventually categorize the whole universe, okay? So the point I'm saying is the most important part of your brain is right connected to your nose so you don't wanna be smelling toxic stuff. That was the point of that. Okay, um, being fat. Fat people have bad outcomes, okay? When I look at brains and I see a fat person, I look at the side of their neck and if I see rolls, on the, rolls of fat on the back of their neck on a scout image for a brain uh, CT or MRI, I call that the hot dog sign, meaning that those rolls, like let's say, you know, like the rolls in a bunch of packaged hot dogs on the back of their neck, I see them. Um, it means the BMI is over 35. Body mass index over 35 it means they're fat. All right, well, anyways, the fat people, when I look at their brains, they're much more likely to have small strokes, silent strokes, problems with their brain, diabetes, high hemoglobin A1C marker or prediabetes, okay? They don't do well. You don't want to be fat. Um, what do I consider a high fat diet? Any diet over 15% of calories from fat. I actually recommend, you know, try to keep your calories below 10%.
the lower the fat percentage of calories, the skinnier the population. The three lowest fat foods are the starches. Rice, like white rice, uh, potatoes, sweet potatoes. They all got 1% or less fat. So those things make you skinny. They make you less likely to have atherosclerosis and diabetes. You know the old saying, China before 1970, when they were rice eaters, 85 to 95% of their calories, a billion out of a billion of them are skinny, no diabetes, no hypertension. When T. Colin Campbell wrote that book, China Study, you know, back in the 1970s, he's looking at the data. They'd have whole, you know, counties and provinces with average total cholesterol is around 90, okay? <laughs> That's quite low. The average American is about 220. Uh, you got to stay below 150 to minimize your risk of coronary artery disease to next to nothing. Okay, so the main thing that causes diabetes is high-fat diet, especially saturated fat. But other fats also do cause increased insulin resistance and also excessive dietary sodium, a lack of potassium, a lack of magnesium, um, circa inhibitors. We'll talk about circa inhibitors later. But just be aware of that. The most important thing is fat. So you don't want to eat a high-fat diet. By the way, all this paleo, keto, carnivore, it's all a bunch of nonsense. The reason there's all these like good-looking people about 40 to 50 years age on the internet promoting those diets is because, look, big agriculture is a multi-billion dollar industry. So is the fast food industry, the processed food industry. So they need to sell their stuff, okay? If people actually listened to me and cared what I said and I was well-known and all these other low-fat vegans, everybody would be healthy. The pharmaceutical industry would lose a lot of money, okay? The people selling all this junk food would lose a lot of money. So they're never going to let it happen. There's always going to be all these charismatic, good-looking people on uh, the internet telling you how great fat is, all right? They have to do that, okay? That's their advertising. You'll notice, I got no production here. I got no editing. I got no sponsors. I'm an ugly old ball guy, okay? That's where the truth comes from, okay? Look at McDougal. He's even older than I am, all right? That's where the truth comes from. It don't come from good-looking 40-year-olds uh, who are getting paid to tell you fat is good for you, okay? So learn how to use your brain. All right, let's see what else do we got here. Hypertension. Hypertension is the number one risk factor for small, silent strokes in your brain. Like I said, you want to stay in that Goldilocks zone. And the only way to get in that Goldilocks zone is to eat right, live right, okay? So that's the smart money. And I trust myself to follow a healthy lifestyle and diet a lot more than I trust some big pharma company to give me a magic pill that's going to some over, somehow take over the physiology of you know your complex body. Okay, um, like I said, pressure's too high. You damage the small arteries in your brain and they gradually are decreasing their ability to deliver oxygen in the tissues because the chronic high pressure hitting them causes scarring and fibrosis of their walls so they thicken and that's the thickened uh, arterial wall is less able to deliver oxygen to the tissues. Um, okay, and then if you drop the pressure too low, you don't perfuse the brain. All right, let's see. All right. Yeah, in countries where people, you know, eat a low-fat primarily plant-based diet. They don't ever get diabetes, hypertension, any of this stuff. All right, next page. Alcohol is a poison. All that stuff about one or two drinks a day was nonsense. You don't want to do that. Uh, marijuana, fool's paradise. I've seen people get schizophrenic breakdowns from marijuana. Sometimes it's laced with PCP. It's feminizing. You show me a marijuana promoter, I'll show you a fool or a liar. Okay, uh, let's see what else. Opioids. Never take opioids. So you got to remember, too, the drug companies want to sell their stuff. So they're always going to tell you, oh, the side effects are minimal. Yeah, BS. I've seen a bunch of bad outcomes from opioids. I know doctors, nurses, technologists who've all lost family members to opioid overdoses. They're very dangerous, those drugs. Super dangerous. Okay, uh, excitotoxins. Now, excitotoxins, this is something pretty interesting. There was a guy by the name of John Olney in 1969. He wrote a big paper about how MSG, monosodium glutamate, uh, causes brain damage. Okay, And he was, became pretty famous with that. Of course, the food companies don't want this becoming famous. Especially the Japanese used to put a lot of MSG in their food. And when the Americans found their rations, you know, like after World War II, they're like, wow, this tastes good. So everybody wanted it. It's a flavor enhancer. That's what it is. MSG tastes good. They call the taste umami. Okay, so anyways, what I'm saying is the food companies try to put this in everything. They used to put this in baby food, all right, and only help get it out of baby food. That's not good. Baby brain's a lot more sensitive. It has a less intact blood-brain barrier. 
but still it's in almost every processed food. If you only have one ingredient, they're not allowed to put it in your food. That's why I only eat one ingredient foods. As soon as you got two ingredients, they're allowed to put it in the second ingredient and not even tell you. MFG just means manufactured free glutamate and that can be ways that they industrially manufacture. We're not gonna get into all that now. I got separate videos on MSG and MFG and all this stuff. Okay, but um, remember 80% of brain excitatory neurotransmitters are glutamate. And so these are things that are glutamate equivalents in some form. Uh, MSG. And the, some people say, well, the brain has an intact blood brain barrier. No, not so fast. The brain has what are called circumventricular organs that are chemosensors uh, around the ventricles of the brain. And those will allow some glutamate in under normal conditions, yet alone under abnormal conditions. Let's say you have a part of your blood brain barrier image damaged by previous head trauma, damaged by previous diabetes, damaged by previous hypertension. You're going to get a leakage of that MSG in. Plus, I don't know if some of it's transported. We don't have time to get into all the, 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 the chemistry of it, but I avoid MSG, I believe, for good reason. I've got doctor friends, guys who are top of their class, who can't eat MSG or they get bad headaches. You know, you remember Chinese restaurant syndrome? People are variable in their sensitivity to it, but it's something you want to avoid. Okay, aspartame, which is the sweetener that also functions like an excitatory neurotransmitter. I mentioned to you that glyphosate, you know, the, the thing sprayed on GMO, the non-organic stuff, is glycine phosphate, okay? And then glycine is part of the receptor. The NMDA receptor for uh, glutamate in the brain, let's say here, let's say this is the NMDA receptor. The way it works is you get glutamate binds to one part of it and then glycine binds to the other part of it to activate it. So when you have increased glycine available in the form of this glyphosate, um, that's thought to be an excitatory neurotransmitter effect uh, on that neuron. By the way, that neuron is a little bit interesting. I'll show you something kind of cool about it. So imagine this is the neuron. See, I'm lucky I keep all this crap on my desk. I can use it for these examples, these talks. I kind of like this talk, just talking from the newspaper. Okay, so imagine this is the NMDA receptor, postsynaptic neuron. It's the receptor for glutamate. In the center of it, you got magnesium. So magnesium is sitting in the center of that. Inside the neuron below that, there's a negative 65 millivolt uh, plasma membrane gradient, okay? And so this magnesium is attracted to the negative charge inside the cell down here. So imagine this green is a negative charge inside the cell. All right, but when you start to depolarize the cell based on activation of another receptor letting sodium in, um, then you'll depolarize the postsynaptic neuron, the, the charge will be dissipated, the magnesium will then pop out of the NMDA receptor, and now calcium, the orange stuff will be for calcium, will come into the cell, all right? So that's the glutamate postsynaptic receptor, the NMDA receptor, the relevance being is, if you have a patient who's magnesium deficient, then you've got less magnesium available to be blocking that receptor. Okay, so magnesium deficiency, which is like one of the most common deficiencies in Americans. Magnesium deficiency, potassium deficiency, and fiber deficiency are the three most common deficiencies because they come from plants and people don't eat enough plants. So if you're deficient in magnesium, you'll have less magnesium available to keep this receptor blocked. Okay, because normally when that's present, the calcium can't go in through that receptor. All right, so basically plant foods, they solve almost all your problems for the simple reason because that's what we're made to eat. Okay, um, let's see what else. I talked about caffeine being an excitotoxin, increases glutamate transmission at that receptor. Uh, I talked about psychological stress being a, uh, causing the problem there too. This uh, real smart scientist, Michael Mersenich. Okay, here's another guy, Michael Mersenich. He kind of did like brilliant work uh, uh, studying brain science, okay, especially, you know, with regard to hearing cochlear implants and autism, okay, and he's also, he's a big fat guy, that's why I think, like I said, too, that's one of the reasons you say, why am I so confident, because I know all these, I know a lot of these scientists, I study them, okay, <laughs> lots of them, they're absolutely brilliant in their field, but they're big fatsoes, okay, they don't know nutrition, okay, all right, you know, like I said, a zookeeper knows what to feed an animal, but scientists and doctors don't know what to feed people, so it's kind of funny in a way. But anyways, what did he say? He says, if you want your brain to be smart, you have to train your brain every day. You should, if you want to be good at reading and articulating things, you should read and speak in an intelligent way every day. If you want to be a great musician, practice and maintain it every day. Um, if you don't do that, the things atrophy and they don't work so well. Um, all right, well, anyways, let me, let me get back to mitochondria inhibitors now. Um, Mitochondrial inhibitors, there's a whole bunch of things. I give a recent lecture on this with, with a lot of illustrations and all that. But basically, we talk about it. If you've got a, a gap between metabolic demand and you've got oxygen and glucose delivery, having bad mitochondria in this neuron is the same thing as having less oxygen and glucose delivery because it can't make as much ATP per molecule of glucose. So all of these uh, mitochondrial inhibitors are real bad for the brain. So there's tons of them. 
we talked about dietary fat, especially sat fat, trichloroethylene from dry cleaning. That's why I don't take myself to the dry cleaning. You know, I'll get told sometimes, oh, my, my shirts look wrinkled. I could care less, okay? I'm an old married guy. I could give a rat's ass, all right? You know, when you're 30 years old, you want to impress the girls, you got to look all sharp, you know? I'm an old guy. I don't care uh, if, if my shirt has a wrinkle. So what? Who cares, all right? Uh, I don't care if my shirt has a ring around the collar. My wife will throw it in the garbage if she finds it. I have to hide my shirts from her because it's too expensive to be buying new shirts all the time. Um, let's see. What else? Uh, fluoride inhibits mitochondria. Cadmium inhibits mitochondria. Cadmium is like from, you know, brake pads on cars. Um, aluminum is in the water. It's in tap water. It's in deodorants. Um, mercury, lead, they're all mitochondrial toxins. Um, the glyphosate is sprayed on the non-organic food. It's sprayed on soy. It's sprayed on oats. It's sprayed on non-organic oats, non-organic beans. That's why I'll, I would only eat organic oatmeal. That's why I would only eat organic beans. I only eat organic anyways. Okay, uh, processed food in general tends to be bad for mitochondria. There's a, The food dyes in it also are often mitochondria inhibitors. There's preservatives. Typical preservative is going to be something like a fungal inhibitor because Mold grows in processed food, and it spoils and gets sent back to the company, and they lose money. So they put fungal inhibitors in there. Well, guess what? Fungal inhibitors are very often mitochondria inhibitors. Because, you know, our cells have a lot in common with mold, okay? A lot of the same enzyme pathways. So something that's toxic to the mold tends to be toxic to us, and that's why I don't like food with preservatives in it. Okay, a lot of medications are toxic to mitochondria. Lots of these, well, first of all, Tylenol is, you know. A lot of geniuses think, well, I'll just pop a Tylenol, and they think they're smart. No, you're stupid. Um, if you have to, yeah, maybe, but I wouldn't make a habit out of it. Lots of antibiotics are toxic to human cells in, in our mitochondria. Uh, aminoglycosides, fluoroquinolones, beta-lactams, uh, tetracyclines. And, and look at fluoroquinolones. That's an interesting one. So the quinolone is thought, you know, it's something that gets increased blood-brain barrier penetration, also better, better penetration into the gonads and the testicles, the ovaries. And so they'll give those for uh, a lot of for infections. Okay, but here's the point I'm making. They attach fluoride to it, it, it replaces the hydrogen, binds tight to the thing, it helps it get across the blood brain barrier. But the fluoride is also a neurotoxin, so you got a double neurotoxin going up into your brain. They're both mitochondrial toxins. You think you want that? I don't want that. Antibiotics are more dangerous than people realize, besides what they do to your gut flora, potentially increasing the risk of leaky gut. Omega 6 cooking oils, and this goes back now to the work of Tetsumori Yamashima, the Japanese scientist. I previously made a video, a couple of videos about his work. Interesting stuff. Okay, um, yeah, that also damages mitochondria. Um, excessive dietary iron. I made, I made like about 10 lectures on iron, the whole physiology of iron and stuff. Um, iron overload leads to progressively increased amount of ferrous redox cycling and oxidative stress, okay? Fenton reaction inside of mitochondria, subsequent injury to the mitochondrial inner membrane due to lipid peroxidation. Um, the other thing to know about excessive iron and iron overload is you then predispose to another type of damage, something called ferroptosis, um, another form of iron overload being associated with lipid peroxidation, uh, meaning destruction of plasma membranes, destruction of other membranes. Okay, oxidative stress is basically when you've got more, anti more oxidants than antioxidants. So antioxidants, let's say it's the good guys, the green guys here, right? Um, normally you want slightly more antioxidants in your body than oxidants, all right? Plants are full of antioxidants. Why do plants have antioxidants? Because they're out in the hot sun all day. If you are out in the hot sun as an animal, a person, you go, man, it's too hot. You go walk in the shade. You go walk inside your house, okay? A plant can't do that. It has to sit in the hot sun all day. The only way a plant can protect itself is by all these chemicals, antioxidants. So the plant's got tons of them. When you eat the plant, you get those antioxidants in your body. If you eat an animal, eat an animal, the animal don't have any antioxidants. It's already used them up. So that's why you get... It's like all the good stuff comes from plants, okay? They've got the antioxidants. They've got the fiber. They've got the potassium. They've got the magnesium. That's the stuff you need to be healthy, okay? They're also high in carbohydrate. You want a diet that's maximum in carbohydrates. You want to minimize protein and fat as much as possible. And that's a true story. And you'll see that the persons who tell you the truth and know the most, like McDougal, myself, you know, and, you know, Caldwell Essison, will tell you the same thing. You're not going to see, you're not going to see any disagreement there, okay? It's everybody who wants to sell you stuff or give you this new wave BS about paleo, keto, carnivore. They're going to start, you know, taking down the path of good fats, which is like, you know, that just that phrase, good fats, causes brain damage. It makes people do all kinds of stupid things. All right, I made separate videos about all that stuff. Okay, um, let's see what's next here. 
Some pesticides are toxic to mitochondria. Yeah, you need your mitochondria to, to live. There's even one of the big theories of aging is due to mitochondrial damage, okay? Oxidative stress and mitochondrial damage. Um, we talked about antifungals being toxic to mitochondria. Most personal care products have some type of antifungal preservative. That's why I use as few as possible. That's why I'm a big minimalist. I recommend live like Adam and Eve, but with indoor heating and plumbing. You don't need all this crap, okay? And I told you too, like my wife's bathroom versus mine. Mine is so simple. There's only one transparent bar of soap, hypoallergenic with nothing in it. And that's it in my bathroom, in my entire bathroom. I don't even shampoo. I got almost no hair, so it don't matter. But I don't need any shampoo. My hair looks the same if I shampoo or not. So why put that shampoo in it with all those chemicals? Even a baby shampoo that I see has got two or three estrogenic chemicals in it. You think that's good for a kid? Just one of the many more estrogenic chemicals a kid's exposed to? You don't need any of that crap. You know, and I went to my wife's bathroom. I'm talking to her. I said, what are you doing? You got 55. I counted them. Cosmetic products. And she's like, you don't understand. A woman would rub, would rub shit on her face if she thought it would make her look prettier. And I go, well, that's what you're basically doing. It's stupid. Um, she said, oh, I'm just jealous because I got wrinkles. Okay, fine. Uh, let's see what else here. Uh, circuit inhibitors. Okay, well, we're going to come to circuit inhibitors. Oh, the point I would say is I, I gave lectures on this that the net effect from circuit inhibitors, the inability to pump calcium out of the, plas out of the cell cytoplasm, into the endoplasmic reticulum. Circa means sarcoplasm, endoplasmic reticulum, calcium ATPase. All right. And so what happens is calcium is the big thing. It's the on-off switch, the light switch inside of a cell. And you've got these other things in there. And let's make this the endoplasmic reticulum. This will be the calcium. All right. And normally this turns the cell on. And once the calcium gets high in the cytoplasm, the neurotransmitter is released. All right. So then the cell has to be turned off and it'll take this calcium and it'll pump it into its endoplasmic reticulum. But if you break the pump on this membrane here, the circuit pump, let's say this is a circuit pump and it has to go through the circuit pump to get in there. If you break, break the circuit pump by inhibiting it with some chemical, then you can't get your calcium out of the cytoplasm and the cell will stay activated. It'll keep on releasing neurotransmitter, more neurotransmitter. And this overactivation of the cell will drive up its metabolic rate till it goes out of proportion to its oxygen glucose delivery. Cell dies. All right. So the balance has to be maintained. And what I'm basically saying is the net effect from an excitotoxin, glutamate, glutamate mimic, a mitochondria inhibitor, something that drops your energy production, or a circa inhibitor, something that prevents you from being able to pump calcium out of your cytoplasm so you can turn the cell off, it all causes the same thing. It all progresses to overactivation of the cell, thus increasing the risk for apoptosis due to the gap, neurovascular uncoupling, an uncoupling between the neuron's metabolic activity and the vascular delivery of oxygen and glucose, okay? Plus the chronic damage from hypertension and, and diabetes to the small arterioles will decrease their ability to get oxygen and glucose. It'll widen this gap by lowering this, okay? So that's how it works. So it's not that complicated. And you notice how once I give you this theory, you know what to do. Just avoid all this stuff. Eat right, avoid all this stuff, all right? Versus when somebody starts telling you about some, you know, BS theory about beta amyloid. They confuse the crap out of you and you're like, you don't know what to do. And they do that on purpose because if I tell you your problem is genetically you're screwed up, you got bad genes, blame your parents, okay? What I'm basically saying is there's nothing you could do, buy my pill. <laughs> that's what that's about, just so you know. Okay, and so the point I'm saying, the significance of circa inhibitors, mitochondria inhibitors, and the cytotoxins all having the same effect is that it all adds up. Lots of people are exposed to 20 of them. Some people are exposed to 30 of them. It's not a big surprise that the average American over 50 years age, they're kind of tired looking, 55 or so or more. They're often cognitively slow, you know, pleasant but cognitively slow. That zest and zip and life, vitality, that glow of health, it's gone, all right? Okay, so uh, the circa, again, means sarcoplasm, endoplasmic reticulum, calcium ATPase, the pump to pump calcium out of the cell cytoplasm. Um, the sarcoplasm word comes from in muscle cells, like skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, visceral smooth muscle cells, and arterial walls. They have a sarcoplasm. They got a bigger, you know, more unique calcium storage site. In other cells, it's just the endoplasmic reticulum, abbreviated ER. Okay, uh, we talked about this, the calcium. We pretty much covered the circa concept. Um, what else? Diabetes drop circa function. You know, look, it can drop in general circa function almost like 50%. It's a big deal. Diabetics are notoriously stupid, okay? I talk to lots of diabetics. They're often very nice, very pleasant people, but most of them, in my experience, they're just clueless. They're almost always telling me, my diabetes is under control. My diabetes is under control. It's under control. I'm taking my pills. It's under control. I'm taking my injections. It's under control. You know, my hemoglobin A1C is not that bad. 
okay, fine, but you know, why settle for sticking yourself every day and taking all these pills if you can just cure yourself by eating a low-fat vegan diet? Wouldn't that be better? Yes, and that would improve your long-term prognosis. All right, anything that smells bad, lots of things that smell bad, they're circa inhibitors, okay? Paints, glues, adhesives, automobile exhaust, they drop circa function, okay? Uh, these preservatives, a lot of them drop circa function, BHT, BHA, TBHQ, all this crap. Uh, red dye number three, uh, alcohol, fluoride, marijuana. So that's what I mean too. Things like alcohol and fluoride, they're like multi-purpose poisons. They, they just damage a lot of things. Pretty much whatever they contact is damaged in some way. That's almost why they're such a slow poison is because they slowly destroy things. If they if you drank you know a glass of fluoride water and you rapidly keeled over and got sick, they go, oh, that's really toxic. We've got to take that out of the water. But the fact that it just slowly kills you, it, it just goes all over the place breaking stuff, okay? You don't notice it. And you don't know where it's coming from because it's a gradual, slow toxin, all right? And alcohol is like that, too. I look at alcohol brains. These alcoholic brains, they're shrunken. They're pickled, okay? Not good. You don't want to drink alcohol. It's for losers. Okay, benzopyrene inhalation from grilling meat. Yeah, I got some family members, too, that'll grill and cook meat. I get out of The fumes are toxic. But the worst thing is if you fry it on one of those uh, nonstick cookware, Teflon, POFA-type uh, cookware things, you inhale that crap, cooking oil fumes, that increases your risk of lung cancer significantly. I gave, previously gave a lecture, cooking oil fumes and lung cancer, women who don't smoke who get lung cancer. That's a lot more common than people think, okay? Um, yeah, and I got a lot of people I know, my family and relatives are like, oh, you know, I'm aging so well. I'm, cause I'm like 60 years of age, okay? And, and, and they'll say, I'll go, well, gee, you know, maybe it's because I don't poison myself like a dumbass, you know? I got a lot of people that are like, oh, you know, you're, you know, I'm too obsessive compulsive because I think about all these things. I go, no, I think that's the secret of functioning well is you do a whole bunch of little things, each one that seems insignificant by itself, but in aggregate, they add up to give you good function. That's what you want. That's how you improve yourself, your brain health and other parts of your health. Um, in inhalation of large amounts of chlorine is toxic. I used to know that because in my old house, I used to have to do the pool sanitization and I would work with liquid chlorine. If you accidentally inhale it, you're like, ugh. And they say that that drops circa function in the heart transiently. Not good. Uh, many estrogenic chemicals, EDC is the other word from quite often used, endocrine disrupting chemicals, they also decrease circa function. Bisphenol A, nonalphenol, atrazine. Atrazine is the common one sprayed on uh, non organic corn and a lot of other non organic foods, sometimes on golf courses too. Um, sunscreens often have chemicals that will drop circa function. Titanium dioxide nanoparticles can decrease circa. Um, they're often used in sunscreens. They're also used in, you know, like as a whitener. They're used in uh, medications, cosmetics, processed foods. Nothing good about processed foods. R avoid them as much as you can. Oh, okay, I think we're basically finishing up here. Here's the last slide here. All right, so nonstick coating, um, POFA. The other thing, watch out for dental floss. You want to get an unwaxed dental floss. Because the ones that, that feel good, they slide perfectly, those are the ones that got Teflon, a polymer, a, a fluorid, fluoridated chemicals. They're bad for you. You don't want to use those. Get rid of them, okay? I use the unwaxed one. Yeah, it breaks in my teeth once in a while. So what? It's not a big deal. I also use those interdental brushes. Let's say the floss breaks in my teeth. I'll take an interbrush, interdental brush and just pop the thing out. whoop de doo No big deal. Okay. Um... Don't use those nonstick cookwares because they got POFAS, polymers of fluoridated chemicals. Best to cook on stainless steel cookware. You don't want to cook on iron too because you cook on iron cookware, you get that into your food. Titanium might be good, but I don't know enough about it yet. Um, aluminum inhibits circa, so you don't want to wrap your food in aluminum foil. That's stupid. Like many years ago, we went to some like uh, place when we were traveling okay where you had to order a submarine sandwich or something and they want to wrap mine in aluminum i refused the guy wrapped in aluminum i refused to take it. i said no i told you not to wrap it in aluminum i'm not taking that one make me a new one and my kids were like pinching me and saying what a jerk i am you know they're all embarrassed you know how kids can't handle public embarrassment and i said no i'm doing the right thing i'm not i don't care you know i'm not too intimidated by people because i figured you know the guy serving me the sandwich he's an idiot okay if he doesn't do his job it's not my fault i'm not going to accept it um it's good to be a little bit stuck up because I know that if you're stuck up, you tend to do the right thing. I mean, be nice, but be a little stuck up because what I mean by that is you have to respect yourself. You have to respect your opinion because I see a lot of people who are kind of weak and wimpy 
And they let themselves get abused and they do all kinds of things that are bad for their health because they're too weak to speak up when somebody's treating them wrong or unfair or doing something stupid to them. They just socially want to just ease it away. So they'll eat the food off aluminum. They'll do all kinds of stupid stuff. Okay, um, let's see, what else? Oh, Stephanie Seneff, she's a lady who wrote this book. Her book was pretty good, Toxic Legacy. And she says that the glyphosate uh, herbicide increases blood-brain barrier permeability. And she actually believes that by increasing blood-brain barrier permeability, it's creating um, a setting where aluminum can get increased access into the brain. I read some other book too when I was reading about the chemistry of fluoride that somehow it can form combinations or something related to aluminum. Um, I haven't read that recently. I'd have to double check the details on that. But you see how you're, you're sort of brewing a perfect storm here. You got one thing damaging the blood-brain barrier. You got another thing that's toxic to the brain, another thing forming complexes with it. And then all this junk is getting into your brain and then it'll cause damage in your brain because your, your brain's supposed to be protected by a blood-brain barrier. Okay, it's not made to have all these toxic chemicals getting into it. Smoking cigarettes, forget cigarettes, they're all for idiots. Vaping, cigars, they're all toxic. Um, everything is bad about cigarettes. Don't ever smoke a cigarette. Okay, let's see. Avoid leaky gut because it lets all this stuff get into your body, the bacteria, the bacteria, endotoxins, and all that stuff. I got videos on all this stuff. Douglas Cal, I just had some quotes at the end. You know, in order to live a good life, we need to learn what is good for us and do those things. Just common sense. A lot of common sense came out of those ancient Greek philosophers. Aristotle, the first step in an intelligent conversation is to remove emotions. An intelligent person, they'll sit there, they'll let you talk, then they take their turn, you talk. They don't get all emotional, but I know how it is with a lot of relatives and stuff. As soon as you talk about diet or nutrition or obesity, they get all emotional. Anyways, um, this is a newsletter for this month. And so the, the key points of the whole thing were especially minimize the risk factors for diabetes and hypertension. And in so doing, you dramatically lower your risk of uh, ever becoming demented. Uh, exercise, read, think, study. And also avoid the risk factors for leaky gut. Because the leaky gut risk factors, they not only increase your risk of atherosclerosis, they increase your risk of uh, oxidative stress, they increase your risk of dementia, they increase your risk of autoimmune disease. They're significant. And, you know, being a minimalist, and eating the whole food, low-fat, low-sodium, plant-based diet kind of does all the stuff. So anyways, hope that was helpful.